So yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna uh, try to basically do a tour de force th through all the tools we developed uh, to reconstruct what we refer to as anatomically uh, realistic uh, circuits. Um, and as I put in the title course, I figured this is uh, <coughs> what this meeting is about from uh, subcellular structures um, to macroscopic scales and how we can use then these uh, uh, circuit reconstructions to do some simulations to bridge the gap not only uh, across structural but also uh, across uh, temporal scales. So uh, basically what I'm going to show you uh, today is a brief uh, description of how we actually acquire all the data. So one difference uh, uh, to the blue brain since it's been mentioned is that most of our data, or basically all our data, is from uh, preparations in vivo. So the uh, recordings are done uh, in the living animal under different stimulus conditions, behavioral conditions, uh, as well as the cell labeling is done in vivo and also the reconstruction of neurons, which allows to basically reconstruct the neurons within the context uh, uh, context of the real circuitry. You will see that. Uh, second, I will tell you a bit how we keep track of these huge amounts of data, uh, how we annotate it, how we kind of uh, do a quality management, uh, which then in the end allows us to integrate uh, data from many different preparations to standardize it in a way that we can integrate them and build up uh, neural networks uh, from uh, all this data. And then I will give you a kind of an example what you may then be able to do in terms of simulation with these network reconstructions. To make it a bit more uh, kind of plastic or uh, interesting, um, I will try to explain the tools and methods we developed on one specific example you heard in the morning uh, about the whisker system and basically the only thing uh, you need to know uh, if you're not familiar with the system is that the deflection of a single whisker uh, is relayed to the brainstem, I don't have a pointer, so to the brainstem uh, from which is number two then to the thalamus and then to the cortex and the uh, and this is like any kind of sensory modality, uh, you know, it's always uh, brainstem, thalamus, cortex. But the nice thing about the whisker system is that, that they are kind of somatotopically uh, uh, arranged uh, structures, which are called these barrels, also in the thalamus. And what I try to explain here is how the thalamus activates the cortex. And the nucleus in the thalamus that's associated with uh, whisker uh, processing is called the VPM. Okay, so at the macroscopic scale, what kind of structures do we need to reconstruct um, to be able to build kind of a network? So what you see here is kind of an atlas-like view of the rodent brain and you see the uh, whisker cortex, the somatosensory whisker cortex, takes actually up a quite large area uh, of, the, uh, of the cortex. So just for scale it's about 3 by 3 millimeters uh, in size in the red. And uh, if you do a tangential kind of a top view onto the cortical surface, you see um, the layout of the barrel cortex. These circular structures are individual barrels, and these barrels process primarily the information from a related principal whisker. And if you take a coronal cross section uh, through this uh, tangential view, you see it on the right hand side um, down. Yeah. <laughs> down there is, would be the thalamus in, in the center of the slice um, and then uh, you see the barrels. And you can already infer from this kind of cartoonish version uh, the difficulties, the cortex is curved, the thickness of the cortex changes, um, the, the columns or the barrels are tilted with respect to each other, uh, the depths of the barrels is slightly different for different barrels and so forth. So what we <coughs> do as a, always as a first step is do we, uh, histological sections uh, a long uh, tangential cutting plane, so we cut the brain starting at the PS surface all the way down to the white matter and then reconstruct the reference landmarks for everything we need. So the reference landmarks in our case are the, uh, the PR surface which is traced as the circumference of the individual sections. Then we also trace the white matter which is shown in blue down there. We also trace uh, the barrel uh, outlines and we tra 
trace the blood vessels, which are hardly visible as these orange uh, little circles in each brain section. And these uh, structures are automatically extracted in high resolution images. High resolution is here a micrometer, uh, uh, approximately a micrometer in voxel size, so that we have a real 3D reconstruction of all the large macroscopic anatomical structure in the system. Just how this may look like, so this would be the reconstru 3D reconstruction of the cortical surface from this tan tangential view. Um, then embedded in there the 3D reconstruction of the white matter surface. Then the blood vessels uh, throughout the entire uh, uh, cortex here. Just because I did this on the plane, my laptop didn't do a good job, but you basically have the 3D pattern of all the blood vessels uh, in this volume. And then you can also extract automatically uh, the three-dimensional outlines of all the barrels. So you have a nice anatomical reference frame. And we've done this for many different animals. And uh, what this allows you to do then is to standardize these landmarks from many different animals and figure out what's actually the variability between animals in terms of this 3D layout and uh, uh, quantify how accurate is actually an average barrel cortex if you want to reconstruct uh, the system. And what we found to our surprise is that there's very little uh, variability uh, between individual animals at the same age. Um, and uh, so all our experiments are done at P28, so it's always the same age approximately the same weight, same hemisphere. Um, and what I mean, little variability means, for instance, the difference in cortical thickness is on the scale of 50 micrometer between animals. The difference in barrel sizes and volumes and locations is on the uh, scale of about 30 microns. So it's very little variability between these uh, these structures. So from this macroscopic resolution, which proves to be kind of uh, preserved across animals, we do the next step at the cellular resolution. So we want to know how many neurons uh, or cells in the first place are distributed here. So we again developed a high resolution imaging technique, in this case uh, kind of a high throughput confocal microscope and uh, a set of other uh, uh, tracing algorithm, as you see again here, this would be just one section, so again about four by three millimeters. On the top left corner, you already see parts of the pier uh, in, in dark or in black here are, are the blood vessels. Um, and if you look kind of, you know, this more dense area uh, would be the barrel cortex here. So if you zoom in, you see actually all the uh, cell bodies uh, here. We developed a technique to automatically uh, detect all the center locations of all the neurons uh, here. And since we want to do it with respect to the anatomical landmarks, we need to know where the barrels are. So we do a counter staining to reveal the barrel pattern so we can actually extract the number of neurons with respect to the individual barrel columns, to the blood vessel pattern, and to the PR surface. And then you get the number, for instance, of cells for this particular column or for the neighboring column, and so forth. And then basically for all the columns. And this would be, it's roughly about half a million of neurons in the barrel cortex, but now you can actually uh, uh, see already differences between individual columns, so there's nothing like a stereotypic column. All the columns are different, uh, not only in terms of geometry, but also in terms of cell numbers. For instance, the uh, 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 columns in red, which are in the so-called A row, have only about eight to 9,000 neurons. Uh, the columns on the left-hand side in blue uh, have already about 30,000 neurons. So there's already a huge difference in just terms of cell numbers uh, between a column. So if you... It's reproducible across individual animals. Exactly. So not only the uh, 3D reference frame is reproducible, uh, but also the cell number. So the variability in terms of cell numbers between animals for the same column is on the order of 5%, so very low. But it's a 300% difference between different colors, uh, columns in the same animal. Okay, but... Do you have an estimate of how accurate is your counting technique? Yes, so it's uh, about 97% correct compared to manual counting of uh, all these cells. Yeah, But um, compared to uh, other studies that uh, the only uh, quantitative study at such scale was from the Kleinfeld lab uh, and we came up with exactly the same uh, density of 130 
36,000 whatever. So it seems to be uh, comparable uh, also to other automated counting techniques done in other labs. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is just the cellular resolution, so what we uh, need to do now is to figure out what kind of cells do these 10, 30, 20,000 or whatever represent. So we again developed an automated uh, high throughput imaging and reconstruction technique to reconstruct the exons and dendrites from a large number of in vivo labeled cells, so the complete exon. Um, I'm just showing one example here since I uh, w wanted to show you this kind of uh, thalamocortical activation. So what you see here is a reconstruction of a single thalamocortical exon projecting all the way up uh, from the uh, up from the VPM. Uh, the dendrites are shown in blue through the white matter and then entering the cortex. And again, we reconstruct these uh, cells with reference to all the anatomical landmarks, so the, uh, that we have a way to s to integrate them to the neuron distributions and to the uh, other cortical reference schemes. Of course, we cannot only reconstruct uh, a single cell, but we can, uh, this is a zoom in, uh, we can also reconstruct many cells. This would be one of the thalamus uh, recipient cells in, in layer 4, just the dendrites of a typical layer 4 spiny stellate cell um, that may receive uh, input from the thalamus. So this is kind of the ground anatomical data or the basic anatomical data we have the reference structures, the, 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 the neuron distribution, um, but you can also do mm, kind of uh, uh, in determine different subtypes if you have a certain genetic mouse or molecular marker or whatever. For instance, you can determine the fraction of inhibitory interneurons among all uh, cells of, for instance, uh, uh, somato statin positive interneurons if you want to and so forth. So it's not limited to just all the number of neurons but you can do this for any particular stain uh, you're interested in. Um, but then we need to integrate this somehow. So we're talking here about hundreds of terabytes of imaging data, uh, many reconstructions, uh, all with respect to different anatomical landmarks. Uh, how do we keep track of all this data in terms to build a model out of that? So to do this, we developed a database called the Cortex-DB uh, 3D. Um, and the database, what its main major purpose is, is to kind of convert all the uh, reconstructions because over time you know you keep adding new things to the stuff to the stuff as you figure out more things to convert it into a standardized format um, that is primarily uh, useful for a consistency check of everything you did because this is done by different individuals over a long period of time so you want to make sure that everything uh, is, is nice and correct so consistency check in this respect means are all the labels correct? You know, are there any loops in the reconstructions? Uh, is the annotation uh, done correctly, and so forth? The standard format we're using to store our morphologies is the HOC format from the neuron uh, simulation uh, tools, but it can be uh, converted into any other kind of uh, uh, data format that is out there. And the nice thing, of course, you can associate meta information to all the individual to make queries and, and, and browse and whatever. Um, but the major feature of this, uh, or the major thing of this database, is that you can do a standardized feature extraction of all the different morphologies. Uh, feature extraction, this sense means, for instance, simple parameters like dendritic lengths, but you can also. Uh, uh, <coughs> get it with respect to anatomical landmarks, let's say how m what's the exon density of cell A in the superficial layers of this column versus this column and so forth. Um, and this allows us then to do kind of an analysis that we are confident that it's correct because all the data has been treated the same, has been registered to the same. And it's, I should emphasize that it's very important to register these neurons to their anatomical landmarks because slicing the brain is not an easy task and reconstructing cells from slices is also not an easy task. And you can get all kinds of systematic errors if you slice the brain and if the orientation is slightly different. Um, and we tried to do some cluster analysis of cells that we didn't re register, for instance, to these landmarks, and this proved to be m almost impossible because you have all these kind of systematic errors. So if you really want to do cell typing uh, of cells based on anatomy, you should take care 
to minimize all the systematic errors you're actually doing here. And one example what you can do then for instance is to reconstruct many cells. I'm only showing the dendrites here but we've also reconstructed the full 3D pattern uh, of all the axons here. But based on the dendritic uh, morphology you can do a cluster analysis within the database and come up with kind of objectively determined cell types and one benefit of doing the cell typing here is that you not only know what discriminates cell type A from B but also you get an estimate of the location where you can find a particular cell type in a particular 3D reference frame which is indicated by the colored bars on the left hand side for instance uh, the brighter green these are layer 4 spiny stellate cells for instance uh, found kind of more within the center of the barrel while another uh, cell type in layer 4, the so-called star pyramids in darker green here, are also found closer to layer 3 and layer 5. Um, yes? Okay, just ask if the database is publicly accessible again? Hopefully by the end of the year. Yeah. So we're working on it. We want to make it a nice uh, format that's not embarrassing uh, for non-computer scientists uh, like us. Um, yeah, so we, we it's, it's on its way. Yeah. Um, and uh, so this gives you kind of a, a way to classify cell types and locations and so forth. But then we want to build networks out of this, so how do we do this? So we have the 3D reference framework and what we do as a first step, we uh, split up our 3D, it's about, as I said, 4 by 4 by 2 millimeters uh, into 50 micron voxels. Um, and. Uh, uh, then register the neuron distributions which I said are very uh, kind of stereotypic across animals uh, to this uh, 3D reference framework. So with every, within every 50 micron voxel we know exactly how many neurons are located within these 50 micron voxels. We also know at a certain location in space what kind of cell types do we find there. So we replace each individual soma by a 3D reconstruction that was found with 50 micron position at this point in space and take it from the database and put it in there, keeping the right orientation, location and so forth with respect to these anatomical landmarks. So what we end up with is kind of what we refer to as anatomically realistic reconstruction at least within 50 micrometer precision. And this is just an example how it looks like. This would be the side view it's up there uh, on the top is the standardized PR surface and the, the barrel outlines projected onto the PR surface, the white matter, the individual barrels. And you c if you register, for instance, these salomocortical exons uh, into its respect, or oh, first of all, the soma distribution, you first register the soma distribution, which is based on neuron counts into this framework, and you see then the number of neurons. You can actually already kind of see the barrels based on the, the soma density here uh, and uh, the different densities of cells and the different layers and then you replace them for instance with the thalamocortical axons traced from the VPM so this would represent about 250 of these thalamocortical axons here you can paste in other cell types or just visualize other cell types for instance these layer 4 spiny stellate cells but you're not restricted to one particular column so you basically register them to every place in the barrel cortex you find and then uh, uh, superimpose them and you can also do this uh, for uh, different columns so to speak. Um, as I said this is just an example you know all the blank spot is filled up by other cell types and we also have the intracortical axons uh, not only the thalamocortical axons in here this is just an example how this network assembly process is taking place. So this would be kind of the transition from the macroscopic to the cellular resolution how do we make map connectivity in this? So as I said, even though the anatomical layout of the rebissal cortex seems to be very stereotypic, the numbers, the morphologies and so forth, um, we don't believe that geometric proximity of exon and dendrites is good to predict connectivity in this sense because as I said, with 50 micron position we can do that but if we want to predict a contact, a contact this is at much smaller scales. Um, so what we do is we count the boutons along the axons and the spines along the dendrites and convert our axon distribution, which was shown here, our axon distribution to a bouton distribution. 
with 50 micron resolution and the spine dendrites to spine distributions and do a statistical estimate within these voxels how many contacts this particular cell may receive. So we're not saying, for instance, this is the layer 4 cell I've shown you in the beginning. Uh, what you see here would be kind of the 50 micron resolution innovation by the thalamus for this particular cell. So the color code reflects a certain number of contacts and we can then place on the dendrites that are located within a respective voxel randomly synapses uh, onto the cell. And we're not claiming that this connectivity may be the correct way to wire the network, but this is at least a constraint uh, how it could be and we can then investigate based on these constraints how different anatomically, uh, anatomical wiring patterns may influence the cell's function or the network function. So to sum this up I've shown you how we can using high throughput imaging and reconstruction techniques reconstruct landmarks reconstruct these landmarks and also the cell distributions and then the exons and dendrites uh, which is shown here in the bottom uh, again just to illustrate it. Um, I've shown you how we keep track of all our data with this database and how we standardize it and how we then integrate it uh, to do uh, anatomically realistic uh, network assembly and get finally even an estimate of how many contacts a particular cell may get from a particular presynaptic cell type. So that's nice in terms of structure, but how, what can we actually do with this in terms of simulations? Um, so the networks we're building up here uh, basically try to incorporate all the pathways we find. So we don't restrict ourselves to kind of a dogmatic view where we say this is the network and this has to mean something, so, but we reconstruct all the exons and whatever structure we find is connected to this, we have to incorporate to the network. Um, for instance, we found that the connectivity, for instance, between different cortical columns even exceeds the connectivity within a cortical column. So if you want to understand the, how the whisker information is processed, you cannot just crop off the rest of the cortex and uh, so you have to incorporate this. So therefore we needed a simulation framework that, is, that scales in terms of you know, an increasing size of the network um, and in collaboration with the University of Heidelberg and in particular with Stefan Lang uh, there, uh, we developed this NeuroDune uh, simulation environment and just a, a couple of things I liked about it. First of all, it's written in C++, which makes it easy for a non-scripting expert to uh, figure out what the source code actually means. Uh, I, I personally like C++ a lot. Um, but another nice feature that is, of course, therefore easy uh, transferable from one uh, uh, compiler to the next from different hardware settings and can be easily optimized to different hardware conditions. Um, it's based on finite volume elements uh, which has certain advantages uh, in terms of numerics for, for convergences uh, of, of the solvers. Um, it is based on an n-dimensional adaptive grid which is probably the key feature uh, of this uh, NeuroDune environment which allows to automatically refine the uh, mesh, so to speak, or the grid, uh, in t the spatial grid as well as the temporal grid um, um, based on the status of the cell or the network. Which means in reality the cortex, or at least in our simulations, the activity is ra rather sparse. It's not like that all the cells are constantly active and doing a lot of stuff. Most of the cells during most conditions are actually silent don't do anything. Uh, so rather than computing all the cells with the same fine grid and accuracy, uh, we only compute where actually something is going on within the network and therefore get a huge speed up uh, in terms of sim simulation times. So, you s so are you saying that you're doing both a variable time step and a variable compartment number? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the advantage uh, in this is you can set a, a certain kind of uh, error margin you want to meet uh, and then the grid is automatically refined and uh, we've shown and I think that's also on the website uh, that it's uh, uh, an improvement for at least the networks we looked at so far in terms of speed up. Of course if you have a network that where all the cells are active you know a constant grid may be faster uh, but in our case where you have sparse 
uh, uh, activity, this seems to be appropriate. So this is based on Leibniz uh, uh, algorithm. No, this is a, a, a different one. It's, uh, you have to look it up on the on the web page uh, how how it's uh, called exactly. Is it Gabriel's Vitum stuff? Like, um, no, it's, what it's, called it's underneath, no, it's specifically not related to anything uh, from Gabriel Vitum. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. There, uh, if if there's at all competition between the blue brain and us, there's. Yeah, and it's not nothing to do with it anyway. <laughs> um, okay, but what can we do with it? I, I'm showing you the same neuron I've shown you as an example bef uh, before. You see the uh, 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 VPM synapses as one realization how it could be. And what we can do now with this Monte Carlo simulation approach, we can just investigate how different structural and functional connectivity patterns influence the activity of an individual cell, but within the uh, context of the entire network. So in green, for instance, this is a subsample of active synapses we chose based on functional recordings that we know if you deflect a whisker, only about 60% of the thalamic neurons fire one action potential with this certain latency. So we only activate about 60% of the thalamocortical synapses vary their locations and investigate what's actually the consequence for the spiking activity of this individual neuron. And then since it's within a context uh, of, of the th real 3D circuit, you can immediately compare the simulation results to data that you've obtained in vivo or even better to functional imaging data. So just one example at the subcellular uh, scale, what you s see here on the left hand side are the spiking activities of neurons uh, measured in vivo upon whisker deflection. So these are the little dots. The, the color refers to a specific cell type. And at the, at the bottom uh, uh, axis, you see uh, the number of thalamocortical synapses that has been predicted for this particular neuron within the network by our network assembly process. And if you sort this by certain cell types, you actually find for some cell types, not all, for instance, on the top left corner, uh, this would be the layer four spiny stellates, that the spiking activity of this particular neuron correlates very well with the estimate of thalamocortical synapses we got here. So simply speaking, if you reconstruct the 3D morphology of this p a particular cell, know its 3D location, you can predict its spiking activity in vivo just based on this network assembly process. There are other cell types where it's not possible, for instance for the layer 5 cells, which see a much more diverse input, have a much more complex uh, dendritic tree and uh, more uh, active conductances and therefore it's maybe not such a very simple linear relationship between input and output of the cells. But if you don't care about synapses and, and, and subcellular scales and, and just uh, have, for instance, two photon calcium imaging and care about uh, what's the overall network activity at the cellular scale, so what you see here on the right hand side is a top view of the barrel that we've simulated based on whisker deflection input. And in green are cells that responded uh, with an action potential in our simulations. Blue are cells that showed no uh, 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 super threshold activity. And you get the impression from this one simulation trial that it seems that cells that are located closer to the center of the barrel seem to be more active. Um, and if you do this for many simulations with varying configurations of connectivity and synchrony and so forth, you actually find that this seems to be the case that the closer the cell is located to the center of the barrel, the more active it seems to be, and there's a certain decay uh, towards the barrel center. And fortunately uh, for us, Jason Kerr's group a few years ago did exactly the experiment, two photon imaging uh, after whisker deflection, and they actually found this uh, very nice uh, kind of location-specific uh, decay of spiking probability kind of making a proof of principle here that you can do simulations without any parameter tuning, just Monte Carlo simulations that you constrain as good as you can anatomically and functionally by in vivo data um, and make a prediction that you may recover uh, in vivo. So this is basically simply feed forward input. There's just no, no recurrent, no, it's, so, 
of course, if you, if you want to get the uh, sp spike timing, for instance, right, so this is just spike rate here uh, in this example. But it seems to be, since this is the input, seems to be the underlying theme in processing throughout a cortical column that the input shape or the shape of the input that seems to decay is kind of propagated through the column, at least for whisker deflection. There are other uh, stimuli that look completely different from this uh, uh, picture. But if you don't even care about the cellular resolution, but at a more macroscopic resolution, for instance, using voltage-sensitive dye imaging, here shown on the left-hand side from Damien Wallace, uh, where you see kind of this overall summed network activity uh, projected onto the cortical surface, um, again, with the same input whisker deflection, you can transform the simulation resu results projected onto the cortical surface and try to figure out what particular cell type to what point in time is actually contributing uh, to this uh, kind of macroscopic uh, imaging data. Okay, so simulation part, I've shown you one example. I mean, keep in mind, I'm just showing you an example here for the network. We have the blood vessels in there, which we don't use, because we are not really interested in, in, in blood flow. But if you're interested in this, you have the anatomical reference frame. And if you good equation, the simulator uh, will certainly uh, be able to solve this. Um, and uh, But our uh, major interest is in how different connectivity patterns uh, may influence the uh, uh, responses uh, of, of the circuit. Okie doke, I think I'm done. Uh, so I want to acknowledge uh, people. <coughs> First of all, uh, Bert Sackmann, my long-term mentor, uh, and uh, who kind of pushes us to develop all these tools from scratch and not use <laughs> what people have already done, probably better than we, but uh, yeah, we have to do it from scratch. Um, then Robert Egger, a very bright uh, 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 graduate student in my lab who has uh, been involved in doing the uh, registration framework. Uh, Andrew Johnson, postdoc in our lab, uh, doing uh, uh, the uh, databasing and feature analysis and clustering. Um, Hanno Meyer, uh, postdoc uh, in our lab, uh, who contributed uh, essentially to the uh, counting uh, procedures and to, uh, developing the protocols uh, to make nice uh, histological sections. My long-term friends and collaborators, Christian de Kock and Randy Bruno at, in Amsterdam and Columbia, who uh, do all the in vivo recordings during different behavioral states and also the labeling of the cells and ship a constant supply of filled neurons to Florida. Uh, Vincent Derksen at the University in Berlin, an expert on <coughs> visualization and, and reconstruction methods uh, uh, in Amira. Um, and uh, I mentioned Stefan Long already at the kind of mastermind behind the NeuroDune simulator. Thanks. <laughs>